It's just so wonderful to introduce my very, very dear colleague, David Rind. He and I have worked together low these decades, right, David, um, at Goddard, NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies. David is a distinguished climatologist. His field is climate dynamics. Um, I don't know how many, I don't know how many peer-reviewed journal articles you, you've done, but many, many, many. He created the model of the stratosphere. He he has worked on for he is one of the founding developers of the global climate model at, at our institute, NASA GIS. That's the acronym for it. But David is not has always been a scientist who doesn't just run the model and throw the results over the fence. Always David has been interested in, interested in reaching out to impact scientists to see how that climate science and the projections of climate change that are coming from the model, from the climate variables, how they may change, how the processes may change, will affect the impact sectors. Yeah. So it's so we, uh, uh, David, thank you for great. You know, we're sending great appreciation for you, you thank being you. kind of the climate impacts climate yeah. scientist. So thanks so much. And over to you for your talk on and the, the, the title of the talk is the climate change in climate change impacts. Thanks, David. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, or good day, depending upon where you are. Uh, as Cynthia mentioned, this is the climate change and climate change impacts. And uh, I'm sure many of you have heard innumerable number of climate change talks. But the whole purpose of this uh, presentation in the book and the presentation here is for climate change for the sake of climate change impacts. So it'll have a slightly different slant. We're gonna look at the, the climate changes that are most obviously relevant for climate change impacts. And then we'll discuss it in sort of in those terms. Uh, so um, as you might see, uh, uh, the first slide is how well do we know the climate changes of importance for climate impacts? Uh, in red, you'll see words such as certain, most uncertain, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, IPCC has their own probability scale uh, in which they relate uh, likelihood to, uh, for example, very likely is 90 to 100% probability, likely is 66 to 100% probability. I specifically did not use those probability terms here because this is my take on, on what these things are for the sake of climate change impacts. So there's a general correspondence, but it's not necessarily one-to-one. -one. Okay, what we'll do is we'll go through the different parameters for climate change that most obviously are related to climate change impacts. And we'll start obviously with temperature. Uh, as Martin indicated, the book has a lot of slides, generally about 20 for each talk. Uh, because the book was established over a period of time, there have been some updates in terms of our understanding. For example, the latest IPCC reports have come out. So while I will be using some slides from the book, uh, I will also have added in some uh, slides related to things that have been developed and understand, understood uh, more recently. So starting with temperature, <clears throat> the general trend of temperature is fairly certain in the near term. Uh, in the far term, it depends upon the climate sensitivity and also our political sensitivity. What choices will we make to either mitigate warming or to emphasize economic development. So obviously any sort of climate change impact work has to cover a wide range of possibilities in terms of trace gas releases. We'll also see in the following slides that uh, increased heat waves are probably certain. In fact, they're happening already. But as you also may notice, the locations of, that they've happened in, in the last several decades have popped around from one place to another. 
And I can say that probably as far as we're concerned, uh, the locations probably remain for the future remain pretty uncertain. Um, okay, so uh, this uh, slide from the BBC Met Office uh, talks about general conditions. You can see, as you probably well know, carbon dioxide has been increasing from, this shows from 1958 to 2020. In 1958, the value was about 318. And we know it had been increasing prior to that because the pre-industrial value, say around 1850, was probably about 270 or between 270 and 280 parts per million. So the increase to 1960 was slow and obviously the increase has been much greater since then. The global mean temperature change from uh, 1850 to 1900 is shown in this picture. And as you well know, it's been going up much more rapidly recently in conjunction with the rapid CO2 rise. The observed distribution of warming shows as expected <coughs> greater warming at high latitudes uh, as, not, as was not completely expected. It also seems to show reduced warming in the Southern hemisphere, though even that may be changing at this point in time. Uh, with the tropical warming being somewhat intermediate. How well do we really know these relative to 1961-1990? <clears throat> Obviously, Southern Hemisphere records are, are sparser, but I'd say for most of the world, this is probably a reputation, representation of what really happened. And for uh, later uh, discussion, the uh, global sea level rise from 1995 uh, in terms of millimeters has been sort of almost eight, 80 millimeters or about eight centimeters. Okay. As far as the future climate goes, obviously that depends upon what we do in terms of trace gas emissions. IPCC, this is from the summary for policymakers, has an indication of five different pathways that might be experienced by humans. And this is for carbon dioxide release. And uh, the two lowest scenarios, which show rapid reduction of CO2, I'd say these are pretty much fantasies at this point. The, uh, the, the scenario called 2-4.5 uh, is what people feel is a, is a potentially likely scenario uh, and 3-7.0 is also likely, but uh, hopefully not one to be followed. And the highest scenario, 8.5 for carbon dioxide release, people sort of believe that's pretty unlikely because it's not even clear that there's enough carbon dioxide, uh, enough carbon to be burned or emitted that would produce it. Nevertheless, this shows a wide range of possible trajectories for uh, greenhouse gas releases. Similarly, there are trajectories for methane and nitrous oxide, which also help warm the planet, and sulfur dioxide, which in, indicates basically uh, what aerosol uh, concentrations might be in the atmosphere. These help cool the climate, and in most of the scenarios, they decrease, which is good for air pollution and for asthma uh, sufferers but is not good for the climate because it results in uh, mitigating one anthropogenic factor that actually is trying to cool the climate. <clears throat> um, historically, in terms of uh, the release of uh, carbon dioxide, here we are. And at the moment, it seems we're following what was the 4.5 uh, scenario. Uh, here are the two lower ones. Uh, the lowest one uh, would give us uh, something like on the order of 1.5 degrees C or even less. The second lowest one uh, would be consistent with something between 1.6 and 2 degrees. Uh, if the 4.5 were to be followed, uh, that would be somewhere between 2.5 or about 2.8. And the current pledges and targets would give us somewhere between 2.5 and 2.8 by the year 2100. And put this in the perspective of the, 
the desire to keep the global climate warming below 1.5 and certainly below two. And you can see that the current pledges and targets won't, won't do that. Uh, then the higher scenarios go up to four degrees or more and uh, would probably be fairly disastrous. In terms of what is likely in the near term, the next several decades, uh, again, from the latest IPCC report, you can see that uh, for the time periods between 2021 and 2040, the best estimate is fairly scenario independent. It looks like 1.5 degrees is pretty well baked in to the climate system by what has been released so far. And there's a range of uncertainty. And when you get to the highest scenario, the range goes a little bit higher, but it's pretty well guaranteed unless some disaster of, a, of other sorts happen that uh, we'll be in this range of 1.5 by the time we uh, are starting to approach uh, 2040. For the midterm around 2050, you're now getting a greater differentiation in what the different scenarios would provide. All of them as the best estimate greater than 1.5 and three of them at two or, or greater. And even the, the lowest scenario could, could even get up to two. The biggest impact obviously of the different choices in scenario as, is as you go out towards the end of the century in which you have a three degree differentiation in warming from the lowest to the highest scenario. So climate change impact modelers must prepare for this sort of range. Now, often the, the climate change impacts are looked at primarily in the next few decades up to the middle of the century, but hopefully mankind will exist after that and climate change impacts then for the end of the century really have to be very flexible in terms of what the potential mean temperature change is really going to look like. Okay. Uh, in terms of the distribution of the warming, the observed change uh, for one degree C warming, and by the way, we're now a little bit above one degree, about 1.2 degrees. Uh, this is what has been observed. And this is what models produce. And you can see that the models have done a fairly good job of reproducing what actually happens with this amount of warming. Again, more warming at higher latitudes. This is of course an annual average and seasonally you'd have more warming in winter and less in summer uh, in terms of the mean conditions at least. These are estimates from models as to what the warming would like, look, look like at different levels of warming. And notice at the four degree global warming from the highest scenarios, even tropics over land get much warmer. But again, on an annual and average and also winter, the warming is excessive at high latitudes, especially high Northern latitudes. Now, in addition to the mean conditions, basically a lot of impacts really are associated with extremes. And this is uh, the annual trend in the number of days where the daily maximum temperature exceeds the 90th percentile. In other words, in terms of the natural variability of temperature at a particular location, how many uh, temperatures are we receiving that actually happen only 10% of the time. And you can see uh, from the 1970s on, we've had a rapid increase. <clears throat> this is a distribution of where those temperature extremes have been noted. Unfortunately, not necessarily over Washington, DC, but over a lot of other areas actually there have been great increases in, uh, from 1950 to 2018. Okay. Um, and uh, finally, in terms of hot temperatures over land, again, uh, from the IPCC, latest IPCC report, for a 10 year event in which the warming has occurred only, a warming of that magnitude has occurred only once in 10 years, already now it's likely to occur a, a close to 200% increase, 2.8 times. With a 1.5 degree warming, it would be happening four times, two degree warming, 5.6 times. If we were up to a four degree global warming, it would be happening 10 times in a 50 year time period. In other words, 
something that happens now once every 50 years would uh, basically be happening once every five years. For a 50 year event, something that would happen only once every 50 years in sort of pre-industrial conditions, at a four degree warming, it would be happening four out of every five years, basically. Okay, so in terms of the climate impacts associated with increasing temperature, Clearly, the thing that gets the most play, uh, especially from human and health conditions, are the extreme temperatures. But climate change impact modelers have to look at a whole wide range, seasonal variation, the general trend, in addition to, uh, to the uh, change in extreme. Precipitation, another thing, obviously, of importance for climate change impacts. Uh, there will be an overall increase in precip. I think it's probably happening already because a warmer climate can hold more moisture and therefore evaporate more, more uh, moisture from the oceans. And since the atmosphere relative humidity is not expected to change very much, a lot of that increased evaporation will go into increased precipitation. The distribution of that increase or in fact change is somewhat uncertain. There's a general feeling that as we'll see, there's a rich get richer, poor get poorer scenario uh, where, where it's raining now, it will rain heavier and where it's dry now, it'll get drier. But that's primarily a model result and more likely to, to uh, actually show up over the next few decades than when we get towards the end of the century where all sorts of surprises might arise. As far as precipitation rates, the increased precipitation rate, how, how, how heavy it rains during an hour or during a day, that's as you'll see already happening. And so it's very certain that that will continue. The uh, short-term droughts that we've been seeing pop up around the world, it's fairly certain they will increase as well because the warmer climate can evaporate more moisture from the ground, from reservoirs. And there are instances in even when it has been raining more, the warmer temperature has resulted in drier conditions anyway due to increased evaporation. Again, as with the question of where the heavy rainfall will result geographically, the locations are somewhat uncertain. Okay, so uh, in terms of the mean conditions, uh, these are annual uh, mean precipitation changes uh, relative from IPCC, relative to what we're thinking of as pre-industrial, not really, but 1850 to 1900. And you can see increased rainfall in bands in the tropics. This is sort of the rich get richer scenario and uh, drier conditions in some other regions, say in the subtropics, uh, which are already dry. I have to emphasize that these are not certain, uh, uh, certain this is for 1.5 degree global warming. Things intensify at two degrees and obviously intensify even more at four. You also see more uh, rain at higher latitudes because as the air warms, it can hold more moisture. More rain doesn't necessarily result in increased soil moisture because as we discussed, the warmer climate can also evaporate more moisture. And you can see in particular at high latitudes, the model results, even though they're giving much more rain at high latitudes, do not necessarily indicate soil moisture increases at these latitudes. Uh, given that the magnitude of warming and the degree of evaporation will be somewhat uncertain geographically, as is the precipitation. And since the soil moisture change depends upon both of these, uh, in most of the IPCC reports, there is very little model convergence as to what will actually happen to soil moisture in an individual location. And so impact modelers will have to sort of take that into account when they try to understand what, what is really gonna go on as far as mitigation and, and adaptation. Uh, also on this picture was the trend in the rainfall on the wettest day of the year. And you can see just like the trend in maximum temperatures has, has been going up, so has the trend, trend in rainfall on the wettest day. And these are locations in which you actually have recorded that. 
the gray areas do not necessarily really indicate things haven't happened. In some cases, especially in the tropics, uh, you just don't really have good records for it. Okay. Um, then uh, we can also look at heavy precipitation over land forecasts. And just as was the case for high temperatures, as you go to the different scenarios of warming, the increase of 10-year events and, uh, for precipitation and 10-year events for agricultural drought go up accordingly. And so again, with a four degree warming, a 10 year event that of heavy rain that happened only once uh, prior to this century would now be happening two, 2.7 times. And a 10 year event for drought would be happening four times. Pretty sobering were we to get to a four degree C global warming. Okay, so we've covered, covered temperature and precipitation. The next thing of interest for climate impacts are what's going to happen with storms? What's going to happen in particular with storm tracks? Well, the track, the future tracks are somewhat uncertain, though most models show that storms will likely move further poleward, especially in the Southern Hemisphere and the, perhaps the North Pacific. Uh, we'll see what that means in a moment. As far as the change in intensity for extratropical storms, that's somewhat uncertain. It used to be thought that extratropical storms gain their energy from temperature contrasts, cold air from the north in the northern hemisphere coming in conjunction with warm air from the south. And as we saw, the implication is that the higher latitudes will warm more than lower latitudes, which will reduce the intensity of cold waves and therefore that temperature contrast. But recently, people have started to appreciate the fact that another way to get a temperature contrast is in the warm air of a storm. When rainfall occurs, it releases latent heat and warms up that region. And as the climate warms and you get more moisture in the air, you may get more latent heat release associated with that warming. And that may then serve to increase the intensity of storms. So the intensity change is sort of pretty unknown at this point. With respect to extratropical storms, hurricanes and tropical storms, since they obtain energy from, sea surface, from the sea surface uh, temperatures, and those temperatures are, are unlike, undoubtedly going to warm, it's fairly certain that hurricane intensity will increase. The frequency change uh, is thought it's thought that because the air will becoming more, become more stable in the vertical, since you're getting more warm air, more uh, rainfall released at high altitudes, which will warm high altitude temperatures, that maybe the total number of hurricanes will decrease, especially the weaker hurricanes. If that doesn't happen, I don't think anybody will be uh, actually truly surprised. Okay, so here is, um, going back to extratropical storms, eddy kinetic energy is an indication of the strength of the storm, the energy of the storm. And you see in these contours with the storms maximized now in terms of their eddy energy. And the red indicates where the models suggest that the eddy kinetic energy will increase moving poleward, especially in these regions, the North Pacific, a little bit in the Atlantic. And the blue indicates where it will decrease. With respect to Europe, that would mean more storms for higher latitudes in Europe and less for Southern Europe. And similarly, you see that sort of effect in the Southern hemisphere, which would imply reduced storms, perhaps uh, implicating Australia and more for New Zealand. Uh, projected changes for hurricanes. Uh, this is hurricane categories, zero through five, for 1 degree, 1.5 degree warming and two degree warming. You see under these scenarios, the weaker hurricanes have slightly less frequency um, and uh, the uh, stronger hurricanes have somewhat more frequency. Again, pretty uncertain. There are a lot of different things that go on in this respect. For example, in the Atlantic, if you were to get more El Ninos, that would tend to 
uh, in, in the tropical Pacific, that would tend to reduce hurricane intensity and frequency in the North Atlantic, or frequency in particular. Uh, what's been happening so far is that there does seem to appear in a very noisy record, a slowing down of tropical storm speeds. And this of course is highly dangerous because the amount of rainfall that a tropical storm can impart in a certain area depends upon how fast it gets out of that area. The thought is with more moisture in the atmosphere and more latent heat release, and that being another source of energy for storms when they get over land, it may actually slow down in the future, which would be sort of pretty disastrous. Okay. David, David yes. if you could maybe wrap up fairly soon. We went because okay. we do want to, there's some very interesting, there's some very interesting questions. Okay. Um, wind changes follow the intensity of the storms, hence that's somewhat uncertain. Cloud cover is very uncertain. Uh, for snow and sea ice, general trend of decreases in both uh, are certain. And uh, We'll go through them. Spring snow cover as a function of time has been decreasing. Uh, sea ice changes in the Northern hemisphere, sea ice extent has been decreasing. And uh, in the Southern hemisphere, uh, it had been increasing, but recently has started decreasing. What that means in the long term is fairly uncertain. And uh, the explanation for this is obvious. In a warmer climate, temperatures go above freezing. So the cryosphere is strongly impacted. Uh, in terms of sea level, sea level increases probably is certain because just warming of the ocean will raise, of course, the ocean to expand will raise sea level. And there's increasing uncertainty as to the magnitude of the melting of the ice sheets, which has definitely increased over the past 40 years. Uh, the sea level projections, and in some sense, uh, sea level change may be the most impactful. Here's, global sea level has been rising. It seems to be rising a little faster more recently. As sea level rise, so does coastal flooding. The change in, in the US sea level shown in this graph has been accompanied by a lot more minor floods each year. And uh, for specific regions, uh, there will be presumably a much greater increase in moderate flood events as well. Okay. And um, finally, uh, longer term changes in sea level will depend upon what's actually been happening, will, will actually happen in terms of the release of trace gases. Uh, and the point to make here is that the sea level rise through the year 2100 is but a small fraction of what the total sea level rise will be. Estimates are that the warming we're putting into the ocean now will ultimately cause sea level to rise for hundreds of years, maybe even a thousand years. And uh, to end this on a very negative note, uh, the estimate for 2300 sea level rise from the highest trace gas release scenarios uh, from IPCC, it says a 25 meter sea level rise cannot be ruled out. To conclude, how, will, how and when will we know with greater certainty what the geographical re, uh, uh, relationship is for these impacts that will affect uh, assessments, uh, climate change assessments and climate change uh, impacts? Modelers would become more certain if there was convergence among models for what the future will look like. Models have different parameterizations for various physical features. And for a lot of these issues, uh, there isn't all that much convergence. So as time goes on, we will have both more observations to assess what's going on where, and also hopefully more convergence among models. And um, it is possible that the climate change will outpace our ability to understand what will happen regionally. And climate impact modelers have to then take that into account in terms of trying to prepare probably for worst case scenarios. Okay, thank you. I'll stop sharing and we'll see what the questions are.
Thanks so much, David. We have about five minutes for questions and we have two already. David, would you like to take a few seconds to read Stephen's question or would you like me to read it out? Uh, why don't you read it out? Sure. This is a comment question to David and more broadly. The question of future climate change depends greatly on what human society does briefly on emissions, most importantly, CO2. Does society continue on the same path or reduce emissions? I would assert that the response of GMST to future reductions in CO2 emissions is highly uncertain, to which I refer to figure 4.39 in AR6 which I consider the most important figure in the report. This figure examines the response of CO2 to an abrupt cessation of emissions by multiple models. It shows expected decrease of CO2, but with large variance. But for GMST, the multiple models do not agree even in sign. With that uncertainty, even this quantity, and even for such an extreme change in future emissions, I say that uncertainty is much greater in all other dependent variables and hence much greater than what David is suggesting. Please comment, David. That's from Steve Shorts. Thank you, Stephen. Yes, thanks. Uh, well, I don't actually disagree with you. I think the, you know, the statement often repeated is we don't know what we don't know. And we're basically moving into non-analog territory. We've never had a situation that we know of in which climate has changed as rapidly as we're changing it now. Uh, one, one way we have a little bit of confidence, as you, as you saw, is that the modeled temperature for a one degree centigrade increase pretty much parallels what actually did happen. So at least with that level of warming, I think we have a certain degree of confidence uh, uh, for that mean temperature change. As you get further and further away from one degree, obviously there are very many nonlinear aspects of the climate system that can come into play. And so there are a lot more uncertainties. Uh, and for a number of the other elements, especially those involving uh, water vapor changes, uh, rainfall changes, precipitation, soil moisture, I, I think the uncertainty is much greater than one might hope for. Thank you, David. We'll take one more question. So we have a question from Alan. I believe he's referring to perhaps uh, one of your slides. How can a once in 50 year event occur more often than a once in 10 year event with global warming? Uh, well, let's go back to that slide. Sure, let me stop sharing my slide. Okay. So, um, so for temperature, uh, the, we're talking about nine times a 10 year event, 9.4 times out of 10. For the 50 year event, it's 40 times out of 50 years. So obviously it's a lot easier to get a 10 year event than a 50, 50 year event. But um, so for example, uh, yeah, so, um, I don't think the comparison is not uh, completely parallel. Um, and uh, for precipitation, again, a 10 year event occurring 2.7 times out of 10 years, as opposed to, uh, yeah, so again, uh, I guess this would not be a relevant comparison uh, for the 10 and 50 year thing. So, hello, hello, hello. sorry. Okay, sorry. Maria, hello. <laughs> I think your, your answer machine just went 
Thank you, David. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, David.